Hi, I'd like to uh, thank the org organizers for inviting me here today. Um, so this is going to be a pretty quick uh, review as well because it's kind of a complex uh, topic. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the uh, technical part of embolization procedures. Um, these are disclosures. And so the AVM says we all know are abnormal connections between arteries and veins. Um, typically with uh, intervening nidus or collection of abnormal vessels uh, with feeding arteries and draining veins. They can be divided into to different types, um, the top being more fistulous type connections, which are a direct artery into a venous sac and then going down to uh, multiple arteries coming into a, a nidus and then an, an outflowing vein. Um, and these have been related to different uh, genetic uh, diseases such as hemorrhagic, hemorr hemorrhagic her hereditary telangiectasia, one and two, um, capillary malformation AVM syndrome, and they, these do have genes associated with them, but most AVMs are actually uh, sporadic. Um, and then in, I am a neurointerventionist, so um, we divide our AVMs into many different types. I'm not gonna go over it very uh, uh, li laboriously, but um, depending on where it's located, so in the uh, cerebral matter itself, peel mal malformations are ranging from uh, nidal type malformations to fistulas, which occur mainly in pediatrics. Um, Vanagalen malformations uh, occur mainly in newborns. And then there are malformations that are more fistulous and, uh, and acquired later in life that occur in the dura or lining of the brain. Um, and this can be found in the carotid uh, cavernous region um, where you can also find direct fistulas from trauma. Uh, and then there's a, a whole organization for spinal AVMs as well. Um, and so how, you know, to get to the embolization part, how do we, uh, close these, these uh, malformations. The, the focus and the goal really is to treat the uh, nidus in the case of nidal aneurysms and close this connection as well um, as in the fistulous connection, the focus is really to get to the proximal part of the vein that's receiving the arteries and close that. Um, coils are sometimes used in these cases, but actually uh, less so because you really can only get to these medium-sized arteries or smaller, even tinier arteries with uh, coils, so you can't really get good penetration into the nidus itself. Um, there are there have been use of uh, sclerosing agents, so taking a microcatheter, <clears throat> sorry, into a, a feeding artery, injecting ethanol, 100% um, ethanol, to kind of burn the malformation and uh, and uh, destroy it in that way. Um, but the more common use is uh, uh, liquid um, agents, um, and that can be, uh, there are really two that are in use um, in the U.S. right now. There's NBCA, which is a cyanoacrylate, and then there's onyx, um, which is a polymer, and I'll go into those. And then there's some newer agents in development, and these can be placed into the nidus or into the vein via a transarterial or a transvenous approach. Um, NBCA uh, is uh, you know, closely related to crazy glue. It's an adhesive, so it, it sticks to the arteries. Um, and the goals, as with any embolization of AVM, is good penetration into the nidus. And with NBCA, it is, once it contacts the blood, it polymerizes very quickly. Um, and so you want to prevent proximal reflux along the catheter as uh, prolonged contact with the catheter will cause uh, adhesion to it, and you can have a retained catheter or, or vessel injury when you try to pull it out. Um, Onyx was uh, uh, developed and approved by the FDA uh, in the 1990s, and uh, or actually in the mid-2000s, and this uh, is a copolymer of ethylene vinyl alcohol. It's dissolved in a solvent, DMSO, um, and then there's suspended micronized tantalum powder in it uh, to achieve radio, uh, um, you know, radio uh, opacity. So it needs to be um, shaken right before you inject it or else all the tantalum will settle out of it. Um, and then the 
traditional method of injecting onyx is to inject, uh, and, it, and it looks like this dark color because of the tantalum within it. Um, so you inject little bits along the tip of the microcatheter until you fill the proximal artery here, refluxing a little bit along the catheter. And then as soon as you create, the, the goal of that is to create a plug within the proximal um, uh, artery at the uh, location of the tip of the catheter. And then once you create that plug, uh, when you inject, it's going to go forward and uh, penetrate into the nidus. Um, and so, like I said, a proximal plug is used, and the catheter needs to be removed from the embolic cast at the end of the embolization. So uh, even though onyx is not adhesive, it can be, uh, if you reflux too much along the catheter, you can, uh, this can lead to a retained microcatheter as well, just because of uh, friction in trying to remove it. Um, and if you then pull too hard, you can, this can lead to rupture and hemorrhage. Um, so the tips and tricks, I'm, I'm really just going to talk about a, a few newer techniques that we're using in the last few years. Uh, and one of them is, and it has to do with newer technology that's coming come out. So one is uh, the use of the detachable tip microcatheter, which is called uh, the, the Apollo microcatheter. Um, and it's a single lumen catheter. It has uh, a tip that's actually held into a, a shaft here. Uh, by uh, pressure, by friction, um, and uh, this allows for um, uh, a force being required to actually separate the two. Um, so it's less than a third of the force uh, that you would need to actually break any other part of the catheter. So it's thought that it's a more gentle force of re retrieving the, the catheter. Um, and you basically just pull slowly and stretch and stretch until it detaches, or the whole thing pulls out of the uh, onyx. Um, and this catheter comes with two tips. Um, so this is the uh, distal tip. The proximal uh, marker here is where um, the detachment zone is. So you can't, if you're injecting and you reflux all the way to this point, you have to stop because you're going to then uh, glue that detachment zone in place. Um, and this is an example of a vertebral peel fistula. So this is an AP view and a lateral view, the vertebral artery in the neck, and this uh, fistulous connection to a uh, posterior fossa vein. And this is the navigation of the, the Apollo catheter to the fistula. Uh, and you can see it in place, the distal marker and the proximal marker. And there you see an injection of NBCA. So this, this catheter can be used with both NBCA and onyx. And in this case, uh, it looks like the catheter was completely removed without uh, detaching. So then in a, in a second injection, another Apollo catheter was brought up to a second fistula site. And there's some injection of contrast showing the direct connection to the vein. Uh, and this is a, a video here, and this is um, high concentration of NBCA. So this really, if you were using um, any standard microcatheter, you would not keep it there that long because you'd be uh, afraid of actually um, polymerizing and, and gluing the catheter in place. But because you, now that we have the detachable tip, we're more comfortable trying to get good penetration with NBCA. Uh, and so that's the injection. You can see more. NBCA filling into the venous side of the fistula, and then pull and out. And then you can see, uh, kind of tiny here, but that's the distal tip, and that's the catheter. So it's, it actually detached, and the distal tip of it is left in place. So um, the advantage is with onyx, you, you, you make a reflux purposefully to uh, create a plug, so you know how much you can reflux. And with the NBCA, you have a controlled injection instead of uh, trying to inject quickly and, and then pull it out. Um, so this allows for better penetration. Uh, and then you can, it, it requires less pressure to remove the catheter, so less chance of injuring. Um, the disadvantage, it is a bit, a bit stiffer at the detachment zone, so the connection between the tip and the proximal microcatheter uh, compared with the rest of the microcatheter and with uh, some other um, softer mi microcatheters that we may use. 
Um, and then we've had uh, now two uh, cases where um, on navigating the catheter without attempting to detach the tip, it's inadvertently det detached in a proximal artery. So that's something that if you're uh, navigating in torturous anatomy, it, it can happen. And that's the tip. So the other um, and thing that's come about is the uh, development of uh, DMSO-compatible balloon microcatheters. So these are the scepter balloons. Um, and it's just, it's a dual lumen um, catheter. So you have a, a lumen that you can inject um, onyx or glue or coils, um, whatever you, you want, whatever you're uh, doing. And then a second port to inflate this balloon. Um, and then this is a case, um, so this really allows for really good penetration without having to worry about reflux or make a plug. Um, so this is a case of a, a maxillary arteriovenous malformation. This is the internal maxillary, uh, the patient's maxilla, and you see this abnormal AVM, um, capillary type AVM uh, right here. And then this is the balloon catheter in place. So it's uh, in, in this branch here, and this is the inflation of the balloon. So you create a plug just by inflating the balloon. It's, it's very quick. Uh, and then you can achieve great penetration into the entire um, AVM. This required uh, uh, injection into a couple different feeders, but by using this technique, um, I was able to completely treat, and at the end of this treatment, there was no uh, remaining um, shunting. The important thing when you're using onyx is you have to be able to recognize uh, abnormal and normal and know your Especially in the in the head and neck, you have to know um, where you're located. Uh, avoid any abnormal connections to the internal carotid circulation, um, or any normal connections that are, you might not see but you know are there, uh, because the onyx with this technique can penetrate into small collaterals that are otherwise closed. Um, and then just as a, a last uh, example, this is a 42-year-old man with uh, headaches and tinnitus, and uh, he got this MRA, which shows this markedly abnormal enlarged vessels on the left side of his head uh, from external and, and as well internal uh, circulation, and uh, all going into this, uh, into the left transverse sinus. This is a, a typical uh, dural arteriovenous fistula um, and uh, usually acquired. Uh, this is the MRA showing that fistula. You see some external carotid artery, occipital branches, middle meningeal branches, and then um, on angiography, marked dilatation of these branches. Uh, and you really on the, on the CAT scan, we can see um, that they really all come down to this connection right here into the transverse sinus, or so we thought. Um, however, when we closed that off, we realized that the fistulas were coming uh, to multiple locations along that sinus. And this is one disadvantage of onyx. So after you have to close such a complex malformation with multiple vessels, you're left with uh, this sort of picture in which you can't really see anything afterwards. So um, that leads to my last point, which is the uh, development of this uh, new liquid embolic called Phil, which is uh, currently approved in, the, in Europe. And this is going to be, it's going to have iodine um, attached to the copolymer. And so therefore, that should absorb and it will be less radiopaque when you come back for later treatments. And that's it. I'd like to thank you for your attention.